Hi, it's Symphony, back again with another video. Um, now today we will be reading Sea Biscuit by Laura Hillenbrand. Now this was made. Now this was made into a major motion picture. It's about a famous horse named Sea Biscuit. Preface. In 1938, near the end of a decade of monumental turmoil, the year's number one newsmaker was not Franklin Delano Rose Roosevelt, Hitler, or Mussolini. It wasn't Pope Pius XI, or, nor was it Lou Gehrig, Lou Gehrig, Lou, Lou Gehrig, Howard Hughes, or Clark Gable. The subject of the most newspaper column inches in 1938 wasn't even a person. It was an undersized, crooked-legged racehorse named Seabiscuit. In the latter half of the Depression, Seabiscuit was nothing short of a cultural icon in America. Enjoying Adulation so intense and broad-based that it transcended sport. When he raced, his fans choked local roads, poured out of special cross-country Sea Biscuit limited trains, packed the hotels, and cleaned out the restaurants. They tucked their Roosevelt dollars into Sea Biscuit wallets. Bought Sea Biscuit hats on Fifth Avenue, played at least nine parlor games bearing his image. Turning into radio broadcasts of his races was a weekend ritual across the country, drawing as many as 40 million listeners. His appearance smashed attendance records at nearly every, every major track and drew two of the three largest throngs ever to see a horse race in the United States. In an era when the United States population was less than half its current size, 78,000 people witnessed his last race, a crowd comparable to those at today's Super Bowls. As many as 40,000 fans mobbed tracks just to watch his workouts while thousands of others braved ice storms and murderous heat to catch a glimpse of his private 80-foot Pullman rail car. He galloped over Manhattan on massive billboards and was featured week after week, year after year, in Time, Life, Newsweek, Look, Pick, and The New Yorker. His trainer, jockey, and owner became heroes in their own right. Their every move was painted by the glare of the flash bulb. They had come from nowhere. The horse, a smallish mud-colored animal with four legs that didn't straighten all the way, spent nearly two seasons floundering in the lowest ranks of racing, misunderstood and mishandled. His jockey red Pollard was a tragic Face young man who had been abandoned as a boy at a makeshift racetrack cut through a Montana hayfield. He came to his partnership with Seabiscuit after years as a part time prize fighter and failing jockey, lugging his saddle through myriad places, getting punched, bloody in cowtown boxing rings, sleeping on stall floors. Seabiscuit's trainer, a mysterious, virtually mute Mustang breaker named Tom Smith, was a refugee from the from the vanishing frontier. Bearing with him generations of lost wisdom about the secrets of horses, Seabiscuit's owner, a broad beaming former cavalryman named Charles Howard had begun his career as a bicycle mechanic before par parlaying 21 cents into an automotive empire. In 1936, on a sultry August Sunday, 
in Detroit. Pollard Smith and Howard formed an unlikely alliance. Recognizing the talent dormant in the horse and in one another, they began a rehabilitation of Seabiscuit that would lift him and them from obscurity. For the Seabiscuit crew and for America, it was the beginning of five uproarious years of anguish and exultation. From 1936 to 1940, Seabiscuit endured a remarkable run of bad fortune, conspiracy, and injury to establish himself as one of history's most extraordinary athletes. Great graced with blistering speed, tactical versatility, and indomitable will. He shipped more than 50,000 exhausting railroad miles, carried staggering weight to victory against the best horses in the country, and shattered more than a dozen track records. His controversial rivalry, rivalry with Triple Crown winner War Admiral culminate in a spectacular match race that is still widely regarded as the greatest ra horse race ever run. His epic treble plagued four-year quest to conquer the world's richest race, being one of the most celebrated and widely followed struggles in sports. And in 1940, after suffering severe injuries that were thought to have ended their careers, the aging horse and his jockey returned to, to the track together in an attempt to claim the one prize that had escaped them. Along the way, the little horse and the men who rehabilitated him captured the American imagination. It wasn't just greatness that drew the people to them. It was their story. It began with a young man on a train. Pushing West. Part 1. Chapter 1. The Day of the Horse is Past. Charles Howard had the feel of a gigantic onrushing machine. You had to either climb on or leap out of the way. He would sweep into a room working a cigarette in his fingers and people would trail him like a like pilot fish. They couldn't help themselves. 58 years old in 1935, Howard was a tall glowing man in a small in a big suit and a very big Buick. But it wasn't his physical bearing that did it. He lived on a California ranch so huge that a man could take a wrong turn on it and be lost forever. But it wasn't his circumstances either, nor was it that he spoke loud or long. The surprise of the man was his under understatement, the quiet and kindly intimacy of his acquaintance. What drew people to him was something intangible, an air about him. There was a certain inevitability to Charles Howard, an urgency radiating from him that made people believe that the world was always going to bend to his wishes. On an afternoon in 1903, long before the big cars and the ranch and all the money, Howard began his adulthood with only that air of destiny and 21 cents in his pocket. He sat in the swaying belly of a transcontinental train, snaking west from New York. He was 26, handsome, gentlemanly, with a bounding imagination. Back then, he had a lot more hair than anyone who knew him later would have guessed. Years in the saddles of military school, horses had taught him to carry a six foot one inch frame straight up. He was Eastern born and bred, but he had a Westerner's restlessness. He had tried to satisfy it by 
enlisting in the cavalry for the Spanish-American War. And though he became a skilled horseman, thanks to bad timing and dysentery, he never got out of Camp Wheeler in Alabama. After his discharge, he got a, he got a job in New York as a bicycle mechanic, took up competitive bicycle racing, got married, and had two sons. It seems to have been a good life, but the East stifled Howard. His mind never seemed to settle down. His ambitions had fixed upon the vast new America on the other side of the Rockies. That day, in 1903, he couldn't resist the impulse anymore. He left everything he'd ever known behind, promised his wife Fannie Mae he'd send for her soon, and got on the train. He got off in San Francisco. His two dimes and a penny couldn't carry him far, but somehow he begged and borrowed enough money to open a little bicycle repair shop on Venice. Avenue downtown. He tinkered with the bikes and waited for something interesting to come his way. It came in the form of a string of distressed looking men who began appearing at his door. Eccentric soul souls with too much money in their pockets and far too much time on their hands. They have blown thick wads of cash on preposterous machines called automobiles. Some of them were feeling terribly sorry about it. The horseless carriage was just arriving in San Francisco, and its debut was turning into one of those colorfully unmitigated disasters that bring misery to everyone. But historians, consumers were staying away from the devilish contraptions and droves. The men who had invested in them were the subjects of cautionary tales derision, and a fair measure of public loathing. In San Francisco in 1903, the horse and buggy was not going the way of the horse and buggy. For good reason. The automobile, so sleekly efficient on paper, was in practice a civic menace, belching out exhaust, kicking up storms of dust, becoming hopelessly mired in the most innocuous looking puddles, <clears throat> tying up horse traffic and raising up its ear-splitting lawmakers, ear-splitting cacophony that sent buggy horses fleeing. And since local lawmakers responded with monuments to legislation creativity. The laws of at least one town required automo automobile drivers to stop, get out, and fire off Roman candles every time horse-drawn vehicles came into view. Massachusetts tried and fortunately failed to ma mandate that cars be equipped with bells that would ring. each revolution of the wheels. In some, in some towns, police were authorized to disable passing cars with ropes, chains, wires, and even bullets. So long as they took re reasonable care to avoid gunning down the drivers. But San Francisco didn't escape the legislative wave. Bitter officials pushed through an ordinance banning automobiles from the Stanford campus and all tourist areas effectively exiling them from the city. Nor were there these the only obstacles. The asking price for the cheapest automobile amounted to twice the $500 annual salary of the average citizen. Some cost three times that much. All that bought you was four wheels, uh, a body, and an engine.
accessories like bumpers, carburetors, and headlights had to be purchased separately. Just starting the thing through hand cranking could land a man in traction. With no gas stations, owners had to lug five gallon fuel cans to local drug stores, filling them for 60 cents a gallon and hoping the pharmacist wouldn't substitute benzene for gasoline. Doctors warn women away from automobiles, fearing slow suffocation and noxious fumes. A few adventurous members of the gender sex, gentler sex, took to wearing ridiculous windshield hats, watermelon-sized fabric balloons equipped with low glass windows that fit over the entire head, leaving ample room for corpulent Victorian co coiffures. Navigation was another nightmare. The first of San Francisco's road signs were only just being erected. Hammered up by an enterprising insurance underwriter who hoped to win clients by posting directions into the countryside where drivers retreated for automobiles. Automobile picnic parties held out of the view of angry townsfolk. Ugh. Finally, Driving itself was something of a touch-and-go pursuit. The first automobile imported to San Francisco had so little power that they rarely made it up the hills. The grade of 19th Avenue was so daunting for the engine of the day that watching automobile straining for the top became a local pastime. The automobile's delicate constitutions and general faint-heartedness soon became a source of scorn. One cartoon from the era depicted a wealthy couple standing on a roadside next to its dearly departed vehicle. The caption read, The Idle Rich. When, where San Francisco, where San Franciscans saw an urban nuisance, Charles Howard saw opportunity. Automobile repair shops hadn't been created yet and would have made a little sense anyway, made little sense anyway, as few were fool enough to buy a car. Owners had no place to go when their cars expired. A bicycle repairman was the closest thing to an auto mechanic available, and Howard's shop was conveniently close to the neighborhoods of wealthy car owners. Howard hadn't been in town long before the owners began showing up on his doorstep. Howard had a weakness for lost causes. He accepted the challenge, poked around the cars and figured out how to fix them. Soon he was showing up at the primitive automobile races held around the city. For long he was driving in them. The first American race run around Evanston, Illinois, had been held only eight years before with the winning car ripping along at the dizzying average speed of seven and a half miles per hour. But by 1903, automobile horsepowers had greatly improved. One car averaged 65.3 miles per hour in a cross-European race that season, making the races a good spectacle. It also made for astronomical casualty rates. The European race, for one, turned into such a gosh awful bloodletting that it was ultimately halted due to too many fatalities. Howard was beginning to see these contraptions as the instrument of his ambition. Taking an audacious step, 
He booked a train east, off, got off in Detroit, and somehow talked his way into meeting with Will Durant chief of Buick Automobiles and future founder of General Motors. Howard told Durant that he wanted to be a part of the industry, troubled though it was. Durant liked what he saw and hired him to set up dealerships and recru recruit dealers. Howard returned to San Francisco, opened the Pioneer Motor Company on Buick's behalf, and hired a local man to manage it. But on a checkup visit, he was dismayed to find that the manager was focusing his sale efforts not on Buick's, but on Ponder's Thomas Flyers. Howard went back to Detroit and told Durant that he could do better. Durant was sold. Howard walked away with the Buick franchise for all of San Francisco. It was 1905, and he was just 28 years old. Howard returned to San Francisco by train with three Buicks in tow. By some accounts, he first housed his automobiles in the parlor of his old tricycle repair shop on Van Ness Avenue before moving to a modest building on Golden Gate Avenue, half a block from Van Ness. He brought Fannie Mae out to join him with two young boys to feed and two more soon to follow. Fannie Mae must have been alarmed by her husband's career choice. Two years had done little to pacify the San Francisco hostility for the automobile. Howard failed to sail a single car. At 5.12 a.m. on April 18, 1906, the earth beneath San Francisco heaved inward upon itself in a titanic magnitude, 7.8 convulsion. In 60 seconds, the city shuttered down. Fires sprang up amid the ruined bu buildings, converged and raced towards uh, and raced toward Howard's dealership, consuming four city blocks per hour. With the water lines ruptured and the sewers bled dry, there was nothing to check its course. Wagon horses ran in a panic through the streets, snapped their legs in the rubble, and collapsed from exhaustion. The horse-drawn city was in desperate need of vehicles to carry firemen and bear the injured. 3,000 dead and 225,000 homeless out of the fire's path. Fleeing citizens offered Thousands for horses, but there were none to be had. People were fashioning makeshift gurneys from baby carriages and trunks nailed to roller skates, pulling themselves. There was only one transportation option left. We suddenly appreciated San Francisco as truly a city of magnificent distance, but one was witness. The autos alone remain to conquer space. Charles Howard, owner of three erstwhile unsaleable automobiles, was suddenly the richest man in town. He saved his cars from the flames and transformed them into ambulances by one account. Howard himself served as a driver speeding into the ruins to gather the stranded and rush them down to rescue ships on the bay. His cars were probably also employed to bear massive stacks of army explosives, which were used to create fire breaks. On April 19th, the fire drove the soldiers and fire firemen West in the Howard's neighborhood. Van Ness Avenue, half a block from Howard's dealership, was the broadest street in the city. The firefighters chose it as the side of their last stand. As the fire bore down on them, they unloaded dynamite from the automobiles, packed it into Howard's dealership and the surrounding buildings, and blew it all sky high to widen the fire break. I mean, the fire roared over the rubble of Howard's dealership and reached Van Ness. Exhausted firefighters refused to give. Though it burned for two more days, the fire did not jump the road. 
Howard lost everything but his cars, but he had been insured. The reimbursement check that arrived at his door offered him a painless way out of his automobile venture, but Howard was certain that he could coax his new city into the automotive age. The earthquake had already done half the work for him, proving the automobile's superiority to the horse in utility. Two weeks after the quake, a day's rental of a horse and buggy cost $5. A two-seated runabout cost $100 a day. All Howard needed to do was prove his automobile's durability. He put up one of the first temporary buildings in the quake's aftermath, moved the cars in, and set out to craft a new image for Buick. Few men had, have demonstrated a better understanding of the importance of image than Howard. He could probably thank his father, Robert Stewart, for that. While accumulating a vast fortune in his native Canada, Stewart had become the local point of a business scandal, though his role in it remains unclear. His subsequent behavior suggests a spectacular fall from grace. He left the country, changed his last name to Howard, and spent the rest of his life in exclusive hotels and clubs all over the eastern United States, listing his occupation as traveler. He never again owned a permanent home or stayed in one place for long. He married and divorced repeatedly, gaining notoriety among gossip columnists for slugging one of his wives and engaging in public shouting matches with others. Charles Howard was never close to his father growing up in a Victorian upper-class American, which reputation was social currency. He must have felt the sting of the family's ignominy. He made, he made himself into his father's antithesis. Whereas Robert Stewart Howard was wealthy, his son evidently refused to base his life on its advantages, embarking on his westward journey with Virtually no money to his name, whereas his father lacked the interest or discipline to save his reputation and that of his family. Charles measured himself by his image in the minds of others. It was a preoccupation verging on obsession that would inform his decisions and guide his energies. By instinct or by study, he had an exceptionally firm grasp of the human imagination and how to appeal to it. Habitually putting himself in other people's shoes, he was in his private life charming and engaging, generous and genuinely empathetic. In his public life, he demonstrated an, a prodi pro prodigious talent for promotion and manipulation. Howard knew that to get his automobiles into the public eye, he had to get his name into the press. He also knew that car salesmen didn't interest journalists. Race car daredevils did. Donning a gridiron helmet, a white scarf and goggle, Howard slipped behind the wheel and put on a holy show. He drove his Buicks in breakneck speed races at Calf Born and harebrained hill, hill climbs up the harrowing grades of Diablo Hill and Grizzly Peak. He, he ground through 24-hour endurance tests and stamina runs in which contestants looped up and down local roads until their beleaguered automobiles exploded or shed their wheels. Last one rolling was the winner. He was reportedly the first man to send a car down to Death Valley and the first to push over the snowbanks of the Sierra Nevada, performing the feat on an annual basis. The ventures were not without risk. Dr drivers were killed all the time. The cars also came to s sad ends. The joyous celebration after the first Skag Springs 
economy run came to a tearful halt when the winning car spontaneously burst into flames and burned to the ground. Hatter was early fearless and wildly successful, especially with his sturdy new, new Buick, White Streaks. When he wasn't winning other people's races, he was organizing his own and pressing other Buick agents to join him. The reporters ate from his hand. Here was the dream subject, daring, dashing, photogenic, articulate, Man who is always doing something stunning and always saying something quotable afterward. Out of the rubble of San Francisco, a perfect marriage rose. Howard gave the press a banner headline. The press gave him the public. He and his Buick became local legend. He he and his Buicks became local legends. Where the press fell short. Howard and the Buick management filled in by papering the city with, with full-page ads and brochures, trumpeting every win. Critical to the publicity, su publicity success was Howard's shrewdest decision. He recognized that the common practice of competing with specially fit outfitted Racing cars muted the promotional efforts of victories given the consumer knew he was not buying the race car. So Howard opted to race unmodified stock models, exactly the same cars customers could buy off the dealer floor. He also made the transition from horseman to auto driver as easy as possible for prospective buyers. Because virtually... None of his customers had owned a car before. He gave free driving lessons. Most important, he began accepting horses as trade-ins. The experience he gained in judging horses would be an invaluable to him later. Though he would have scoffed at the idea at the time, the day of the horses passed and the people in San Francisco want automobiles, he wrote in 1908. I wouldn't give five dollars for the best horse in this country. The promotion worked. In 1908, Howard sold 85 white streaks for one thousand dollars each. In 1909, he paid a visit to Durant. The new GM chief was grateful. Howard had virtually created what would be one of the industry's leading markets with, with a handshake. Durant gave Howard sole distri distributorship of Buick as well as GM's new acquisitions. National and Oldsmobile for all of the western United States. Howard began ordering multiple trainloads of cars some 300 at a time, and printed his orders in the company's shipping confirmations in full-page ads. He was soon the world's largest distributor in the fastest-growing industry in history. Throughout the West frontier regions that had long revolved around the horse were now dotted with sleek, modern Howard dealerships. He wasn't done yet. Durant, for the umpteenth time, took a huge financial leap before looking and emerged bankrupt. Howard bailed him out with a reported $190,000 personal loan. Durant repaid him with GM stock and a generous percentage of gross sales guaranteed for life. A poor bicycle repairman just a few years before, Howard soon had hundreds of thousands of dollars for every penny he had brought to California. In the mid-1920s, Howard began to live like the, mag like the magnet he had become. In 1924, he funneled $150,000 into the establishment of the Charles S. Howard Foundation and built a home for children suffering from tuberculosis and rheumatic fever. It was the first of a lengthy list of philanthropic projects he spearheaded. He also began to live a little. 
finding his elder sons, Lynn and Charles Jr., attempting to play polo with rake handles and a cork ball. He d divested Long Island of its best polo ponies and gave them to his boys, who became internationally famous players. A few, year a few years later, he outfitted a gigantic yacht. The Aris rounded up a crew of scientists and sailed them all down to the Galapagos for a research expedition. He returned with a rare blue-footed booby and a collection of other animals, which he donated to a zoo. He also lived out a fan out of fantasy that he had probably cultivated since childhood. He stumbled upon a magnificent ranch sprawling over 17,000 acres of California's remote redwood country, 150 miles north of San Francisco, near a tiny lumber village called Willits. Fulfilling a long-held desire to be a rancher, Howard bought, bought it. Although he stayed in a mansion in the San Francisco suburb of Burling, Bur, Bur, Burlingame, whenever he was on business, Howard thought of the ranch as his true home. For all his love of the automobile, Howard was still attracted to the romance of frontier simplicity. He strove to make the ranch called Ridgewood, a mall of rustic self-sufficiency, complete with massive herds of cattle and sheep, several hundred horses, a dairy, a slaughterhouse, and fruit orchards. Dressed in embroidered western shirts, Howard surveyed his ranch from a stock saddle on a cow pony. But he couldn't resist a little modern modernity here and there. He sped around his lake in gleaming speedboats in the hills of Ridge Ridgewood. Removed from his business, Poppy Howard watched his sons grow. On the weekend of May 8th and 9th, 1926, Charles Howard took Fannie Mae to Del Monte, California to attend the opening of a new hotel. They left their 15-year-old son, Frankie, behind at Ridgewood early that Sunday morning. Frankie borrowed one of his father's old trucks and set out for a morning of trout fishing with two friends. At about 9 a.m., they gathered up a big catch and headed back toward the main house. Driving along a canyon road about two miles from the house, Frankie saw a large rock in his path and swerved to avoid it. A front wheel dipped over the side of the canyon and Frankie lost control. The truck flipped headlong into the canyon. No one saw it crash. Frankie's friends found themselves at the bottom of the canyon, thrown clear. The truck was near them, wheels facing skyward. Struggling to do the vehicle, the boys saw Frankie pinned under it. They ran to the ranch house and notified the ranch foreman. There was no hospital anywhere near Ridgewood. Closest thing was the house of the town physician, Doc Bab Babcock, who kept a spare who kept a few spare beds to cope with the cuts and bruises suffered by the local loggers. The foreman fetched Babcock and they rushed to the scene. Babcock climbed to the wreckage and used what little medical equipment he had to try to revive Frankie. He was too late. When the Howards arrived, by a special charter train from Del Monte. They were told that their son was dead. His skull and spine crushed. Howard retreated to Ridgewood and remained secluded there for months. Prostrate with grief, Doc Babcock came to con console him and found the auto magnet wrestling with the question of how he could best memorialize his son. Babcock had an idea. Build a hospital in Willits. Howard embraced the idea, underwrote the entire cost, and arranged to have Ridgewood's orchards, fields, and dairy supply, dairy supply the hospital with food. 
Ground was broken by an ox-drawn plow in 1927 and in 1928, with, with Doc Babcock at the helm. The modern, well-equipped Frank R. Howard Memorial Hospital was open for business. Howard remained on its, on its board of directors for the rest of his life. He would never truly recover from Frank's death. In his Buick office in San Francisco, he kept a large painting of Frank, Frankie kneeling beside a dog. Many years later, a teenage job applicant named Bill Nich Nichols casually asked Howard if he was the if he was the boy in the picture. Do you think it looks like me? Charles asked. Nichols said yes. When he looked up, tears were running down Howard's face. In the 1920s, California was not the place to be for a man in a, in a sinning frame of mind. The temperance folks had given America prohibition and had thrown in a ban on gambling while they were at it. A guy couldn't comport with women, and thanks to the ban on cabaret dancing, he couldn't even watch women cavorting by themselves. If he was discovered in the hotel room with a woman, not his wife, his name would appear in the section of the newspaper reserved for public shaming. Everything. Sorry, that was my dogs. I showed Uncle Kim the text. Well, you have to get out in the car and drive. We need to start driving. Then hurry that up so you can drive. Okay, Dad. I will. Everything was closed on Sundays. The only place to go was church. There, he could hear the usual warnings about alcohol, gambling, dancing, and cavorting. When the Southern California ministers were really whipping their congregations into a froth, they, they would get rolling on the subject of the road to hell. A byway that ran south from San Diego at the end of its at the end of its to the town of Tijuana, Sin City, a place where all those despicable things and a whole lot more were done right out in the open. You can't buy that kind of advertising. Thousands of Americans a day were sprinting for the border, for all the fire and brimstone buildup. The avenue that led down to Tijuana was a little disappointing. One might expect the road to hell to be well paved. It wasn't much more than a meandering dirt lane, one car wide in spots, cutting through the blandness of sagebrush and ducking down to an anemic border river. If travelers were on foot, they could usually wade across and catch a borough taxi on the other side. If they had wheels, they could take a somewhat rickety-looking bridge, followed by a road dipping into Tijuana. Now there was some sinning, only recently, as a sleepy village, Tijuana was fashioning itself into California's guilty pleasure. For every restraint enforced north of the border, Tijuana offered unlimited indulgence. During Prohibition, one-third of the business revolved around alcohol, including the longest bar in the world, 241 feet, in the Mexican in the Me Mexicali Club. The, the minute San Diego outlawed cabaret dancing, Tawana bristled with high-kicking girls. When boxing was illegal in California, you can find an abundance of the of the sweet science in Tawana. You could get married anywhere, anytime. Enterprising matchmakers tailed American couples down the streets offering to get them hitched for cheap. Those who declined were offered quickie divorces. 
while single men were steered into one of the many brothels, a cottage industry in Tawana. The town was wide open every hour, every day. In 1929, when the Depression came and poverty began to replace temperance as the narrow, narrower of American life, the Lana business kept prices at bargain basement levels so that northern tourists purring past the clapboard shops along the uh, Avenida Revolution could afford to live high in every conceivable way. Lobster dinners, fine spirits, s salon services, dancing, the place had a state of nature feel to it. Former jockey Wad Studley recalls seeing a truckload of Mexican soldiers pull up in the middle of the desert, force a rape suspect out onto the sand at bayonet point, send him running, then use him for target practice. Morning, sweetie. Corbin? How did you sleep? I am recording. I'm just recording for the channel right now. Tawana's greatest tourist attraction was its racetrack, which benefited from the hard times afflicting the racing industry in the United States. Thoroughbred racing had a lengthy and celebrated history in America, but at the height of the temperance and anti-gambling reform movements in the first decade of the century, a series of race-fixing scandals involving bookmakers inspired a wave of legislation outlawing wagering. The result was catastrophic for racing. At the turn of the century, well over 300 tracks had been operating nationwide by 1908, only 25 remained, and the attrition continued until World War I. In California, the center of top-class Western ra racing, the only track that survived the ban was San Bruno's Tanfren, which barely scraped by. Many horsemen were forced to abandon the sport and sell off their farms and horses. Most of the rest, especially in the West, retreated to a sort of racing underground, a series of leaky roof tracks scattered through Canada and the few American states where the sport had not been banned. For Tijuana, Tijuanans, the the racing ban was a godsend. In 1916, shortly after California's ban on wagering, they opened the Tijuanan race course, which immediately became a haven for American stables and racing fans. It was a dilapidated place. One former writer compared it to an outhouse, but like everything else in Tijuana, it was innovative, offering the first primitive movable starting gates and photo finishes when a departing Hollywood film crew forgot to pack its loudspeaker equipment. Race trackers appropriated the gear, fiddled with it, and soon fashioned the first race calling public address system. The racing was lawless and wild, and the Americans loved it. Among the Yankees pouring down to the border was Charles Howard. He never explained why he came. Perhaps the place freed him from a straitjacket of grief. By some accounts, his marriage already ailing before Frankie's death was staggering. And maybe he needed to get away. Or it could have been that all he had work, worked for mattered less now. The automobile which had given him great wealth had stolen something immeasurably more important. His interest in cars set at least one acquaintance withered. Howard found himself slipping down the road to hell and drifting into the exuberant way back little town. That was the name of a town that they, they named the road the road to hell because the reason being 
Corbin is because Tawana was offering everything that at the time America was taking away by prohibition. They were offering alcohol, they were offering brothels, they were offering women, they were offering racing. They're offering stuff that America was taking away because it was prohibition. So way back, little town. He avoided the girls and the booze. It was the horses that captured his attention. He tumbled along with the race trackers and soon found himself buying a few nondescript Mexican horses and traveling down to attend the races. They were the poorest sort of runners, racing for no more than a handful of pesos. But Howard enjoyed sitting in the stands and cheering them home. On a summer day in 1929, Howard's eldest son, Lynn, invited his father to the annual Salinas R R Rodeo with Lynn that day was his wife, Anita, who had talked her older sister, Marcella Zabala, a local actress, into joining them. For the, out for the outing there in the stands, Charles Howard first set eyes on her dark, wavy hair, straight, <laughs> slender eyebrows, easy smile, schooled in a con convent and raised on a modest horse ranch just outside of Salinas, where her father was a lawyer. She had once been named Lettuce Queen at the annual Salinas Lettuce Festival. Charles Howard was bewitched. Not long afterward, Anita gave birth to her first child and asked Marcella to stay with her. Marcella moved into Lynn and Anita's home, where she said, where she, where, where she and Charles saw each other daily. Though a May and December romance must have caused a sensation, Howard fell in love with Marcella and she with him. She was 25 and the sister of his son's wife. He was 42 and married. His marriage, wounded by Frankie's death, collapsed. In the fall of 1932, at a ceremony at Lynn's house, Charles and Marcella were wed. Well, that's got to be awkward. Hey, J okay, his his marriage fell apart due to his son's death, and so now he's married to his son's wife's sister. Technically, technically, it's not incest. They're not technically related. I don't know. My my brain hurts from that. That'd be a weird thing to explain. Like, oh, this is my son's wife's sister, mm -hmm. and the, I'm married to her. In Marcella. And Marce <laughs> and Marcella Howard found his perfect compliment. Like him, she was deeply empathetic, suddenly elevated into the world of the rich. She moved with an easy, charming propriety, yet had the race rare grace and a plume to make her frequent departures from conventions seem amusing instead of scandalous. She dazzled the society writers. At golf, she packed such a wallop that she swung from the men's tee. In 1935, when Charles organized a five-month African safari, Marcella eagerly enlisted in the adventure. In a world in Marcella's in a world in which women's roles were still highly traditional, Marcella's trip was the talk of the town, prompting the San Francisco Examiner to feature daily reports on her exploits in the jungle. She gave them plenty to gawk at. When a lion charged their party, it was Marcella who leveled her gun and coolly shot the animal. 
And when she found a tiny orphan baby blue monkey, she smuggled him back to New York in a, in a hat box. She talked the Waldorf Astoria into letting her house him in a luxury suite posted for reporters with Bluey and a banana on the Waldorf's plush settee, then carried him home as a pet. She shared Howard's understanding of the importance of image and cheerfully joined him in the public eye. And like her husband, she had spent much of her life with horses. In 1934, Charles Howard could look out from his office and see a city shaped by his vision. The horse-drawn San Francisco he had walked into 30 years before had vanished. Only a few horses clopped down the city streets, and they would be gone before the decade was out. Howard was worth millions, lived in a supreme luxury, and enjoyed the devotion of friends and the admiration of the public. But he was not content. He was ready to move on. Howard's friend George Gianni, owner of a string of fine racehorses, thought he knew where, where Howard belonged. Gianni saw Howard rekindling his lost love of horses and thought he should stop dabbling and commit himself fully to thoroughbred racing. Howard was only lukewarm. He would not enter the business on a large scale, he said, unless he could go first class with the very best trainer. The idea was bandied around a bit and apparently dropped. It took a, it took, it took San Francisco, it took a San Francisco dentist, former pro baseball player, an investor named Charles Doc Strub to change his mind. Five years earlier on a Monday afternoon in the fall of 1929, Straub had sat down in his lucky chair at his barber's and settled in for a shave. He was handed a telephone, sitting there with his face slathered in shaving cream. Straub learned that the stock market had crashed and in a single day he lost everything and fallen into debt of more than one million dollars. Straub put the phone down, stunned. An idea came to him. He had lost his money, but not his connections, nor his eye for opportunity. He would build a racetrack, the finest in the world, and bring horse racing back to California. His timing turned out to be flawless, for the ca catastrophe that had struck him that afternoon had plowed under the entire nation. Over the next three years, as the Depression strangled the economy, state governments searched desperately for re revenue. Californians, hoping to relegalize racing, pounced. For the first time in a quarter century, they received an audience. They received an audience. In 1933, California agreed to legalize wagering on two conditions. First, tracks had to use the Perry Mutual Wagering Machine instead of the bookmakers, whose corruption had prompted the betting ban. Second, wagering would be heavily taxed. Racing was reborn. With a ready plan for a $3 million racing Zanadu built on the built on the site of the vast ran Rancho S Santa Anita at the apron of San Gabriel Mountains, just, out lo just outside Los Angeles. All Strub needed was the cash. He couldn't find a bank to back him, so he went door to door in search of private investors. Strub was turned away from many home homes, but when he called on Charles Howard, he was invited in. Howard, his close friend, Bing Crosby, and se and several other wealthy Californians One. handed Straub a hefty sum to build his no. Anita, his Santa Anita Park. That's a word. Look in there, military. You see the laser? Look in the scope. 
You see me turn on the laser. You'll see a red. You see Yeah. It. Yeah. Pretty cool, Dad. It has laser. It means I don't miss. It's a it's a crossbow. He bought a military grade cro crossbow. It's his new toy. And it's real. Well, I was in the military. I got military ID. So I, I know one. you're enjoying your new toy. Go out and play with it. I gotta see it set up. No, this will go through walls. <laughs> you understand? I know. <laughs> Just tell him how far. Just tell him. <laughs> Corvus says, just don't aim it at me if I come down there. Just tell him that it travels it travels at 350 feet in one second. It, it, it travels 350 feet per second. The arrow. In, in one second, the arrow's already gone 350 feet. Yeah, in feet. one second, the arrow's already gone 350 feet. Hmm? He said, hunt. Oh, well, it can hunt. We don't, uh, down here, we don't have to have a permanent all thing. Oh, uh, yeah, I do. No, to, to hunt. Yeah, I do. Yes, I do. Wait, you do? Yes, I do. You do. Yes. But normal people don't. Right? No. Normal people have to get a permit. But I got a government credential, so I don't need anything to buy guns or, yeah. or anything. No, he's saying hunting permit, to go out hunting. Yeah, you gotta have a hunting permit. Okay. That, that's normal. That's That falls under... I, that falls under I just didn't know because when I was little, we went out with Tim. I didn't know he, he had, had a hunting, hunting permit. License. I didn't know he did. Yeah, you gotta have a hunting license. No, you shoot this thing at someone and you kill somebody with I this. I gotta get back to the reading, okay, Dad? If you shoot somebody with this... Dad, I have to get back to the reading. It's still recording. Okay. Oh, it's re you think, can you delete all No, it, it'll still be there. Oh, no. It's okay. You don't want all this. It's now. fine. It'll be all over the world. It's fine. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Strub spent the money well. He built a track like none... Uh, none other on earth. A cathedral to the thoroughbred so resplendent that writer David Alexander described his first sight of it as one of the most stirring visual experiences of his life. Strub's mountain flanked race course opened on Christmas Day, 1934. I don't know if it's on Facebook or YouTube. It, it, they can't flag. see you. Yeah, but they'll just the word. That it's fine. It was an immense, immediate success to the public and, in consequence, the state, which raked in millions in new revenue. It was just as popular with horsemen, for Strub had the brilliant idea of inaugurating a signature race for the track. The Santa Anita handicap to be held every year in late winter, beginning in 1935. Unlike the Kentucky Derby, which was limited to three-year-old horses, the handicap would be open to any mature horse three years old and up. But it was the purse that stopped traffic. In 1934, American Marquis races carried a net value to the winner of between $6,000 and, in rare cases, $50,000. In contrast, Strub's purse was staggering. $100,000 plus a few thousand dollars in entry revenue to the winner. It was the biggest purse in the world, offered in a year in which the average per capita income in the United States was $432. Strub's purse caused a national sensation. The pot was so distracting that hardly anyone referred to the race by its actual name. The Santa Anita handicap became, in the parlance of race trackers, the hundred grander, or hundred grander. Strub had created the race at the perfect moment. States all over the nation were relegalizing racing under the paramutual system, resulting in a seventy percent increase in the number of tracks. 
racing was rapidly becoming far and away America's most heavily attended sport. From 1934 on, millions of new racing fans turned their eyes to Santa Anita to see who who would claim Strub's pot. The hundred grander became an overnight classic. Everyone wanted to win it, including Charles and Marcella Howard. Perhaps it was Gianni's urging, perhaps the example of Bing Crosby, who was investing heavily in racehorses, and maybe the spellbinding vision of the track their money had built. Whatever the reason, the Howards, especially Marcella, hung their hearts on winning the big race. In 1935, shortly after San Francisco's New Bay Meadows race course opened, Howard assembled a group of modestly talented racehorses and hired a crack young trainer named Buster Millerick to condition them. The stable was registered under Marcella's name. She designed the silks that would become legendary. Crimson and white cap, white sleeves and a crimson vest emblazoned with the Ridgewood cattle brand, an H inside a large white triangle. The horses were fairly good. But Howard had his sights on better things. That summer, he and Marcella bought 15 yearlings at a, at a Saratoga, New York auction. In keeping with his love of lost causes, Howard bought only the worst-looking horses at the cell. Animals who lingered in the ring, attracting few, if any, bird bids. Millerick was a very good young trainer, but for his new yearlings and the hundred gap grander caliber horses he planned to have soon, Howard won the best. In 1935, he went looking for him. And that is the end of our reading for the day.